at 23 minutes to the top of the hour. Thank you so much for being with us here in Morning at NTV. We now step into uh, the discussions for the day. We're going to be having our Kickstarter and of course we're not going to be stepping away from the fever of the moment which is uh, the independence celebrations as Uganda turns the 62 mark of its growth. I believe it. if we were to look at what the Daily Monitor was giving us in translation of life expectancy, as a country, it begs the question, what is our life expectancy? I am Priscilla Regina Nelwaga. Welcome to our Kickstarter. Now, to just give you a background of this discussion, Ugandans are still hoping for a government that will deliver on these values, a free and democratic state that embodies respect for the inherent dignity of human persons and the direct participation by citizens in not just choosing their leaders, but also holding them accountable. You can do the assessment for yourself. Most recently, uh, we have had some people trying to hold the government accountable and the government has counted them uh, behind bars. However, both under Obote's rule and after, this dream has been repeatedly dashed and the case is for us uh, in the current regime. Now, instead, immediately after independence, Uganda was ushered into a cycle of contested electoral outcomes. Uh, we do have the abrogation of the 1962 constitution, the unprecedented authoritarian rule, the civil wars, the military invasion, which all caused a nearly total collapse of the state and has led to eight violent changes of government within a period of 24 years. Uh, we're talking between 1962 to 1986. Now, 61 years down the road, it begs the question how transformational uh, Uganda has been, especially economically and politically. Well, we are going to be having guests uh, that have been able to see some of these events, live some of these events, and can tell the tale of is it true that we are having self-rule or we are in self-deception. Joseph Ocheno, political analyst, is joining us uh, for this discussion. Later on, we expect to be joined by Sarah Birete, a political analyst, and Henry Chambula, deputy RCC for Rubaga. But for now, I'll stand and uh, turn my attention to my guest this morning. Joseph, good morning to you and happy Independence Day in advance. Good morning, please. Um, I'm not sure really there's much to celebrate um, about this day, but um, uh, we must feel relieved that uh, indeed uh, on this day in 1962, um, the instrument of independence at midnight was handed over to Ugandans, mm -hmm. and that was handed over to Milton Obote, uh, the first former prime minister elected democratically, convincingly. Uh, okay, democratically, well, you know. Uh, but yeah, elected democratically and um, convincingly in the sense that he, we had a majority uh, at the time. But also that um, on that day, um, uh, this nation hoisted the new flag. Uh, I was reading part of about his speech three years later, mm -hmm. talking very proudly about our national anthem and talking very proudly about our national flag and talking very proudly also about our our, our motto you know, for God and my country, uh, which these days I, I notice leaders very deliberately omit because I think, regardless of everything else, mm -hmm. <coughs> they, they have a conscience. But looking fast forward to your headlines in uh, today's uh, Nation Media Group's monitor, um, I'm not quite sure whether there's so much to celebrate. Mm -hmm. But that aside also, I need to record that Prime Minister Bote departed this country as president uh, of Uganda Post Congress in a, on this day in, in 2005. Mm -hmm. So as my president, this also is a day of mourning for me and should be a day of mourning for this country because he's the father of this country. Mm -hmm. But reading part of his speech um, three years in, later in 1965, um, these guys over a three year period transformed this country from what they picked from the British. Uh, um, emphasis on agriculture, 
and emphasis on the, what they call the time livestock, meaning uh, and you can think about it from that perspective, emphasis on the number of cooperatives, emphasis on deliberate uh, investment into African businesses, and emphasis on uh, uh, ensuring that the African uh, Ugandan um, claimed their rightful place as an independent nation, but also the number of industries that grew, the number of cooperative mo movements that grew, and the number of intake into uh, secondary schools uh, uh, and, uh, and, and post-secondary schools uh, doubling and trebling. I'll go into the details possibly later. And if you look at that within a period of three years, I was also looking at um, um, a, a conversation that has ensued in the last one week mm -hmm. with our nation state called the Republic of Uganda, where our independence was nearly threatened uh, when there's a Twitter conversation between uh, uh, um, Twitter experts in this country and the United States government. But I can also say that one of the gov governments that um, hosted Uganda, uh, uh, Uganda leaders in middle after independence were the Americans. And President Kennedy hosted uh, Dr. Milton Aborti uh, in, in 1960, uh, later 63. And one of that you know, created the, the, the foundations for investments in education. President Kennedy personally asked what exactly, what kind of area do you want us to focus on? Mm -hmm. oh, but he did not go into arms, he did not go into anything else. He said education and specifically girl child. Mm -hmm. And I'm proud to say that one of those girl child institutions is my Toro Girls, which was built partly in support with support of uh, of the US government. So unfortunate that uh, we are having this kind of conversation today uh, um, and also amidst that we've mixed really who our friends and who our opponents and who our enemies are and why. Mm -hmm. All right. In, in that regard, when you look at the political trajectory that has transpired, especially within the 24 years from 62 to 86, um, what has that had as a ripple contribution, uh, either positively or negatively, to the state of politics that we are facing 62 years later? You know, I, I was listening to your introduction, and to be fair to you, um, our history is substantially conflicted. I, I was contributing to a, a, a feature documentary on Idi Amin in which I try my level best to support uh, the rehabilitation of Idi Amin from uh, the froth and propaganda. And also I seek to review my own life's experiences that I started primary education in Idi Amin's time. And so therefore, what did I experience under Idi Amin in the 70s and in the 80s and post then until today, to try and be as fair and objective as possible. Um, if I get you, um, the first 24 years was a testing period for of our, of our independence. But there is this narrative that seems to present that because we've not had a military coup mm. <laughs> and because we've not had a change even from one household right. you know, in, the, in the last 38 years, so we've had stability, so everything is okay. Um, the first eight years of our independence uh, saw the fastest uh, economic growth in the, uh, uh, the, the history of this country, but also the most fundamental reform in, in, in every sector in, in our economies. Um, that is between 1962 and 1971. But the fact that we were overthrown by Idi Amin does not therefore mean that you blame Ugandans for having been uh, a, a, a country of instability. Mm -hmm. uh, it was actually a country of, in, 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 of, of interest. Amin did not overthrow uh, 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 the first government uh, because we, uh, of anything domestically wrong we're doing, but simply because uh, the people who pushed Idi Amin into government, Amin was persuaded to take over a government in 1971, and he was persuaded by forces who supported him, that included, ironically, the United States, backed predominantly by Israel. But it was really because of, our, of, of partly our foreign policy in terms of a push, anti-apartheid activism, but also, on the other hand, supporting the, 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 the Lumumbist forces in Congo, number two. But then number three, basically our overhauling of our economic and independence identity to work with the likes of the Nkrumahs and others to see total African independence. And it frustrates me that Ugandans in politics, and including Ugandans in academia, Ugandan researchers, including you guys in the, in the fourth estate, the media, we rarely have this critical conversation to say, how did this happen? So we tend to blame ourselves and to blame a convenient section of our population rather than looking at a broader policy. So 1971. 1980, 
the events between uh, April 1979, when we got rid of Idi Amin, those interim administrations of Lule, uh, Abinaisa, uh, the Muanga era, those 18 months. Again, we rarely have conversations of that. In any case, actually, key players in that era were Museveni and many others, and they are around. We need to interrogate these guys, maybe, not through the books that they write, because sometimes they write convenient, book, co convenient uh, to write their history, mm -hmm. uh, their stories. But genuinely, why was Lule um, uh, replaced? You can call it overthrown. Why was uh, he replaced by Binais and not anybody else, not Bidandi Sali, who nearly, actually, the likes of the Botes sort of were favoring at the time. And people say, there comes Binais or Botes Attorney General in the 60s. But in any case, Binais was elected. But why was he uh, overthrown? What was he doing? Those are the critical things we need to do. So if you want me to tell you quite honestly, notwithstanding the various changes of governments and leadership that we had, and quote the mini instability you consider, including Luero War, and take us up to 1985, I believe the first 24 years of our independence built not only the foundation of this country, but in my opinion, that was to me the independent Uganda. Because post 1986 until today, I'm not quite sure whether we, we, we have an independent economy. We do not have an independent health public service. We don't have an independent constitution. We have a rulership that moved from dictatorship to one family organization. So in any case, really, the foundations of independence, and particularly for me, who is UPC, and particularly for me, who looks at the ideological polity of how we ended uh, 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 with these political organizations, the fight for independence of the Muhasas in the 60s and the 50s, what these guys were pushing for, you know? Um, the Musaises would come today and actually arrest the entirety of the regime in charge today for what? For treason. Because we've literally sold everything we claim for independence to a pot of individuals, a pot of families. And in many cases, if you look at the, the recent uh, 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 Rocco shambles, we've sold it back to I imperialist forces and not necessarily external investors, but what Prime Minister Ted Heath calls the ugly face of, of, of capitalism. So if you sell what belongs to you to a dubious mafia, you're really not doing business, are you? Okay, all right. As uh, one who is a privy to these changes, as one a Ugandan, a political actor, and now an analysis in this regard, uh, could you give us your analysis of what were the exact persuasions that led to the eight changes of governance that we have seen over the course of time, six decades down the road? Yeah, as I said, Idi Amin was, Amin did not choose to overthrow the, 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 the UPC government. Amin sought to do so in order to cover his back. Amin was going to be arrested by Milton Obote after Obote's return from Singapore. One for the, the, the allegations and the claims of uh, killing Brigadier Koya. Uh, um, and then number two, uh, the gold scoundrels. Obote sent Amin to Congo you know, to support the liberation of Congo. But Amin got involved in gold deals. So Amin was going to be uh, arrested and detained. So uh, external forces told him that, well, Obote is coming to arrest you, so, but we can help you to, to deal with him for the reasons and the interests of those forces. So Amin's overthrow was that. And in, in uh, Lule's case, I think Lule came and forgot that the National Consultative Co Co Council that elected him and the UNLF sitting that elected him in, in, in Dar es Salaam was possibly not uh, uh, um, uh, some kind of Jankwanzi arrangement. Mm -hmm. So he, he conflicted and contradicted the position of the, 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 the Moshi a unity conference uh, position, position mm -hmm. and uh, started operating as a mini executive president with the executive powers that Mr. Museven has today. But he forgot actually that he had a very powerful alternative assembly, which was the National Consultative Conf Council. There was a, qu a quick contradiction in there, I'll just make it very quickly. And so was Binaisa. Binaisa very quickly um, taking over, instead of preparing for elections, which were a commitment for 18 months after the fall of Kampala, Binaisa sought to g go towards um, killing pol political parties and pushing for, if you like, what they called then uh, the umbrella politics. Um, that, that brought him closer to Museveni, but until Museveni, uh, he, he decided that he was going to uh, reshuffle Museveni in cabinet. So the Museveni joined everyone else, and then they got rid of him. Um, that was that. The, uh, the, 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 the 
the Muangas obviously organized the, the Masi Party election that took place. And then in 1985, you know, it was a, a deal between NRA, DP, a particular section of religious establishment, okay. uh, using the army to overthrow the elected government of 1985. All right. Well, we are also joined by those that are guardians of elements such as uh, the instruments that we're supposed to be uh, binding by and hopefully protected by the Constitution. Uh, Dr. Sarah Bireta, good morning to you and you're most welcome to the program. Uh, we also are joined by uh, Mr. Henry Chambula. Good morning to you, uh, Deputy RCC for Uvaga, to give us an analysis of where Uganda stands uh, as we turn 62 and if it really falls into the question that is on the pages uh, today, life expectancy of our country. Doctor, uh, let's, let's, <laughs> let's look at it from that perspective as we turn 62, the life expectancy of Uganda and what has brought us to where we are today? Well, good morning viewers and fellow panelists. First of all, I want to state that today is Uganda's constitutional day, 8th October. And uh, 29 years of the 1995 constitution, do Ugandans feel that this constitution is the soul of our nation? Because the essence of a constitution is that it is the soul of the nation. A nation is defined by three key things, the people, laws, and the land. So when you look at the nature, the way our democracy and constitutionalism journey has been 62 years down the road, well, it's not that rosy a story, but it's part of what makes us Uganda, the formation, the fault lines, and then the question would be that are we ready then to correct those fault lines? Mm. Looking at a, a belief in the constitution, which has been, well, I think where we have failed most, a belief in the constitution has deluded us as Ugandans. The failure for political transition since independence, 62 years. To the extent that all eight presidents we talk about, other than Dr. Bote, who received the instruments of power and was elected in 1980 elections, the other presidents have come to power through cause. So we have only one president that has not gotten power mm. through the use of force, and, that, and that's Dr. Bote. The rest have captured power. And, and if you read the, uh, you know, order number one uh, by, by President Seven in 1986, we have captured power as an RIA. You know, the, the, that's the key paragraph. Mm -hmm. And have we moved away from that, from NRA capturing power in 1986? I don't think so. Mm -hmm. If you look at the conduct of the army, However much the name changed, the prof and all, with all due respect to the professional soldiers, because it's not everybody in the army that is political and partisan, but there are few elements in the army that are political, that are partisan, that contradict the character of the army as defined in Article 208 of the Constitution. When you look at other elements on use of power, executive power is derived from the people and is exercised through the protection of the Constitution. Mm. Are we seeing the executive protecting the Constitution in regard to public officials that abuse the Constitution? I don't think so. When you look at Parliament, the, the, you know, the key institutions of governance, the key function of Parliament is to protect the Constitution and promote good gov constitutional governance. Mm. Article 79, the rest of the functions that Parliament does come out of that protection of the Constitution, including accountability, budgeting, and others. But to what extent is Parliament today a life protection of the Constitution? So I think we, ha in, we are in a decline phase. We have declined in terms of institutions of governance. However much they exist, some of them are powerless. Some of them conduct themselves in abuse. And people, the people in power, have disregarded the Constitution and the power of the people. So that's largely where we are. And, and, and that Koan has no life. Mm. 
<laughs> okay, uh, Henry Stamuel, in terms of uh, where we stand today, you do have uh, 86, the National Resistance Movement, uh, capturing power. Mm. And uh, not only have they captured po power close to 40 years later, they've captured people, they've captured the laws, among other things. It begs the question, where are the demerits and where are the merits of the current um, government in as far as political transition conversation is concerned? Are we really a sovereign state after all? Maybe. Thank you very much. Uh, good morning, viewers. I'm glad I'm here with the, uh, my friend here, who is a, a political, <laughs> a political, uh, the, the other one, her role in terms of, uh, the, 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 you call it civil society, a political civil society <laughs> person. Civil society are political organizations anyway. <laughs> yes, and in any case, they normally exist he, because politics would have uh, failed. You can see the bastardization. First of all, mm. we must appreciate, uh, we must look at the journey Uganda has moved. Uh, because even the constitution you're talking about, just after independence, the 1962 constitution was uh, overthrown before even 10 years elapsed. So we have constitutional, we had a constitutional over, overthrow. Uh, uh, if you remember the Pigeon Hall constitution and so on and so forth. So I don't want the uh, uh, sir and the rest to, to hold Ugandans that by amending the constitution, you are overthrowing it. No, we have a stable constitution. And uh, many lawyers have seen them quoting the Constitution. Mm. In fact, our judiciary is sounding just because we have the laws, and the laws are protected by the government uh, in power. The issue of transition, uh, we have uh, set all the necessary infrastructure, the necessary foundation for any transition to take place. The Constitution we are talking about today uh, talks about how we can get a, a new president, uh, in the case of the president, uh, the sitting president dies, what happens? In the case of the president is incapacitated to perform his duties as a, as a president, what happens? All of that is embedded within our constitution. Mm -hmm. So I don't want to, 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 to say that because a, a president Museveni has stayed for some uh, good time in office, then we, we are bad off. Mm -hmm. In the case he comes, through a vote, not through through other means. He comes through a vote. The NRM uh, political organization and its members uh, have always sat and endorsed him, and then Ugandans vote him. So on the issue of the trans transition, Sarah and the rest we should not worry. The infrastructure is there to facilitate a smooth transition. Uh, the issue of public officers abusing office. I'm a public officer. I've never, I've never, I've never abused office. Yeah, you don't have to abuse office, but you know your colleagues that have abused no, office. No, but uh, even those who abuse offices have always been reprimanded. We have people who have always been arrested. They've been rep of, reprimanded. Yes. Twenty-one members of the NRA cabinet are basically people who should be in Luzira, and they're still sitting who, with some seventy. Who are those ones? The one of the iron sheets, you want to, to allude to that? One of the biggest scandals, one of the worst scandals, no, I didn't know it. Two ministers are out of office. Out of, ministers are out of office. Out of 23. And they are, they, they, they are in, the, in the courts of law because they were culpable. They were culpable. So, as far as reprimanding the officers who misbehave and commit crimes because of their offices, there is always an action that has been taken. Uh, the issue of the army, she, she talked about the issue of the army. We have a, a very good army, but, uh, uh, members here. We have a very good army. We have a professional army. That is threatening the diplomat. The threat, <laughs> the threat you are talking about. <laughs> I remember, Andy, uh, you people uh, 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 of my age and the time, uh, uh, when I look at you, you may even be uh, older than me. I certainly am, yes. Those, uh, we had days where meeting a soldier was disastrous. We had that, we had that in Uganda. 
But for day, not not in my lifetime. I knew there were cases. I knew there were cases day. in the means time. But the extreme that have happened in the last 40 years, you can't compare with some of the incidents no, 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 that no, no, are happening, happening today. Okay. Because I lived that experience. Okay. Yes. No, no, no. In fact, let me. Maybe I don't know where you you are, but as far as this area is concerned, where I, I grew up from, Central, it was really so threatening, so disastrous for you to find a, a soldier. It's as if you had. A, you had actually, the, the soldier that chased me from Central Uganda, the soldier that chased me from Central Uganda, mm -hmm. were actually Enery, and they chased me from Makere University. So, by the way, so I grew up in this place. Oh, you had to, <laughs> all right, Mr. I, I'm talking about the yeah. soldiers of that time. Uh, but right now, mm -hmm. uh, I normally chat with the, my young people, who are always confused by uh, our colleagues here. <laughs> the younger people will tell you that finding a policeman. You rather find a military man. In fact, they chat with them, they do a lot of things with them. Of course, I'm aware that through attempts through the political tensions, those who want to destabilize the country are always uh, handled by our security forces because uh, the military and the police and other security agencies cannot allow you to destabilize Uganda. You go and manufacture petrol bombs, you throw them in vehicles and what have you, and they just look at you. You cannot form a rebel group and you want to fight government and they just look at you. So much as we have the political space, we have the democracy, we need to move uh, in a disciplined manner. We need to right. ensure you speak that of the laws uh, of this country. Are we having the political space that is shrinking, um, not, civic not space is shrinking. Uh, let's come back to Dr. Virete. We have had uh, four constitutions uh, so far, 61 years down the road, currently running on the 1995 constitution. Over time, some of these laws have been amended. Uh, for example, the term and age limits, uh, which really brought a scaffold in. You you know uh, the legislative house and of course the impact that we see on us uh, today that uh, some leaders such as military leaders going on their social media platforms and speaking uh, with utter arrogance of how they actually have the power to command uh, what next direction this country takes and it begs the question has the constitution over time become useless uh, to defend the people of Uganda and then if so do we need a new constitution altogether. Well, uh, first of all, a constitution is a, a, a national consensus document on how people wish to be governed. It's an instrument for protection of fundamental rights and freedoms, but also an instrument for defining how the resources of a nation are used. Th th those are the key functions of the constitution, plus separation of powers and the judicial power then which protects. So all the for, uh, arms of government are supposed to do work in protection of the people and the constitution. But when you look at the 1995 constitution, largely formed through broad consensus of consultations up to sub-county level by the Odoch Commission and the a constituent assembly that uh, represented people, but there was a dissent of 66 CA delegates that walked out towards the promulgation of the constitution. So the constitution is supposed to provide for the enjoyment and governance of the majority, but also protect the rights of the minority. So we had the 66 member walkout at promulgation level, and the, these members did not sign the constitution, largely in protest of Article 269 then, that was taking away political rights of the people. So the 1995 constitution was largely celebrated as a, as a good constitution, save for a few exceptions like political freedoms. If I quote uh, the late Wapakabro when he was sharing experiences of the constitution with Kenya, he did remark that Unless Ugandans disrupt themselves, but with the 1995 constitution, we should move from a third world to a first world country in 20 years. 
As of today, we are celebrating 29 years. If the late Wapaka bro was alive today, I'm sure his comment on the 1995 constitution would have been different, especially using the, the underscore he put, unless we disrupt ourselves. So I think our journey has not been so successful because we chose to disrupt ourselves. Why do I say so? If you look at the framework of the 1995 constitution, that basically you know, created an imperial presidency, a very powerful presidency. And the thinking was that this powerful president should be able to exercise maximum power, but for a limited time, 10 years at most. So, but in the, the part of the disruption is that you have this imperial presidency or an imposing presidency exercising power in perpetuity. And what does that mean? All the bench in the judiciary has been appointed by one president. Mm -hmm. All officers of institutions of government have been appointed by one president. Everybody in the country is under the ink of one president. When you fail to transit power, you lose so much along the way. As we talk today, our governance institutions are more or less dead. Talk of the, the, the courts of law, the challenges, I'm sure everybody has been seeing, you know, the, the, the judicial and, uh, and concerns of Ugandans, and that affects access to judiciary, access to justice, but also enjoyment of fundamental rights and freedoms. We have petitions that the judiciary today cannot fix, especially regarding the partisan officers in the UPDF. We have three petitions regarding the current CDF and his conduct, but I think the judiciary cannot fix them today because they are under siege. And the, this, these petitions might not be heard, unfortunately. We have what Ugandans, I'm sure, we are all grappling with over the weekend. A CDF threatening members of the diplomatic community. Something that Ugandans would never have imagined mm. under the 1995 constitution that keeps away the army from politics. Mm. And this was part of the history that was rooted in the 1945 mutiny of the East African armies and the conduct of the armies and the ability of the army to disrupt democracy and order in a country. This order was, was disrupted over the weekend. And there is nobody to protect the constitution, including the president. When the president fails to protect the constitution, under Article 99 of the constitution, mm -hmm. the president's power is derived through protection of the constitution. When the president fails to protect the constitution, he's losing his own power. This is the state where we are, that the president cannot protect the constitution and sovereignty of Ugandans mm -hmm. against the conduct of his son. This is the state of constitutionalism. Parliament, about a few weeks ago, had an attempt to debate the conduct of the, of the CDF. The speaker coward, cowardized mm. from Article 79 of the Constitution and suppressed the debate, the presiding speaker. This parliament today cannot debate critical matters affecting abuse of the Constitution regarding the first family. So you have no institution today that can protect the Constitution when it comes to the president the judiciary mm -hmm. and the parliament mm. from abuse by members of the first family. The, the, right. the last power, yeah. Yeah. The, the last Let power, finish, please. the last power rests mm. with the people mm. under Article 3. Article 3 of the Constitution provides that citizens must refuse every authority or any form of, of or any group of people 
from usurping or abusing the constitution. Okay. But, but where are the people today? You are talking about parliament and so it's where we're going and uh, Mr. Chum, you can't be able to react yes. in response to the question that I am coming Maybe with. Leading to the role of uh, Uganda's development, uh, when it comes to parliament, it's also very instrumental in the development that we should be seeing 62 years later, or desired. And there's been comparisons that have been made towards Singapore and South Korea in that regard, being that we and the same age bracket as far as independence is concerned but then is the performance of the current parliament or, or parliament by and large contributing to the development that we are desiring to see of our country yes a comment those asian tigers you're quoting those ones left us when we messed up with the, with the 24 years of our first president so they, they left us we at the same level but they, they left us. Uh, parliament, first of all, is independent. Judiciary is independent. Uh, the statements by, by, by the CDF, you know, uh, Madame Sarah gets a lot of support to carry out his activities from, 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 from the West. So, so does the entire government. Can you debate no, context? No. There is uh, why I'm saying this. The CDF's statement could have been tough on the ambassador, but if but unconstitutional. Is it constitutional? No. Is it illegal? I, I said it could have been tough. Could have been tough uh, as the CDF. But when you look at the way our friends have also been treating us, treating us, especially in the in the operation, is a senior. Where times they get information and they don't, they don't <coughs> it to 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 our people. We have to use our okay. intelligence. Regarding the CDF, he could have matter, been. Yes, was that the best he could, way to conduct he himself could have been in tough. response to the he, things that you were saying? Could have that been tough. Our was in order? Been tough. He could have been tough, but there are circumstances also that we need to look at. At times we don't want to reveal a, a, a lot of a lot of internal things. On the other issue of his statements at times. So do you condemn how he conducted Was himself? in order? I, I said maybe he would have brought it in a, in a different way. Not necessarily saying. So you don't uh, agree with uh, the way uh, in which he expressed it? I think it was a very tough, a very tough statement. But I said there are circumstances. Maybe he could have gone beyond, but there the, are the circumstances which I cannot reveal here because some of the th things I talk. I mean, uh, so okay. So, uh, if so you can't reveal them, let's move to but the role he, of parliament and on its the contribution of, to the development. On the issue of today. Uh, his, uh, uh, you call them political something. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I, I think Ugandans still have a trust in their army. I remember when they started the MK movement and later on PLU, there were younger people who were bringing him. Come, come and come and move with us. Come, we have your birthday celebration, and so on and so forth. So, to me, I also still believe that maybe Ugandan still have a trust. Okay, away a, from that, in, 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 uh, in, 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 another in, thing that we would in, like in, to in, in the speak into. However, um, the issue of parliament, first of all, we have a, a, a parliament that is very stable and very useful. Uh, we have a parliament and a multi-party dispensation. We have the NRM, we have the, the opposition. We also have some representatives of special groups, including, including the military. So when you look at our parliament today, our parliament is independent from the executive. They can make decisions, they can make laws, and indeed they have made good laws. I remember uh, when they made the law on, on, on LGBT2, something like that, the anti-homosexuality um, anti law or act. Some members of the executive were even saying, mm. but I think this is a tough law. So members of parliament said, no, for us we, we must protect our, our families, we must protect our values, 
who we are passing with the law. And right, the law is thank you so much, place. Henry. Uh, you talked about multi-partisan dispensation. We had a second referendum, Joseph, in 2005, mm -hmm. in which uh, 17 years down the road, it begs a question and assessment of what has been the contribution to this dispensation towards the development of Uganda in all aspects. The referendum was um, irrelevant, but um, uh, lawyers like Sarah would argue that uh, considering the, the context of the Constitution, that it was a, nece a necessary process to, uh, uh, to, if you like, to return us formally to multipartism. But as I said, we, as, as uh, opposition and as parties that were fighting against Article 269, we thought it was a waste of public resources. Mm -hmm. But regardless, uh, um, you realize that uh, you asked me about the Constitution of history and then I, I opted out, but uh, you know, uh, I, I knew confidently Sarah would deal with it because she's a, a lawyer and it's fair to, 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 your, to, 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 your, to your viewers. I, I must say that um, if you look at what happened, what has happened since 1996, you know, with the elections, as I said, the, con the constitution was basically literally broken within a, a ten-year period. Mm -hmm. uh, my brother suggests that uh, the part of the early problems was also because of a constitutional amendments. In 1966, constitution and 1967, regardless of the process that happened, 1967 had it not happened, had it not happened, we would not have had independent Uganda today. And that's part of the conversation we're having before my two colleagues came in that maybe we need to have a, a broader national conversation going forward, post today and post independence to look at obstacles that we faced why and circumstances. Really, I'm not sure whether there is any specific reason uh, um, why we've had the mess since 1995, except the fact that there was no spirit from really the executive, Mr. Museveni, and, 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 and this leadership really to go for any process beyond which most of the constitutional makers and framers were, thought, were, 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 thought, were expecting. I have met a number of members of the, the former CA who said some of the challenges that Sarah struck about that the president had a huge amount of powers. Many uh, CA members were saying that they genuinely believed Mr. Museveni, that notwithstanding the huge amount of powers that they gave him, that there was almost certainly a guarantee that he would not go be beyond 10 years. And whatever the powers you have, you have the powers and the privilege to go ahead and impart. But in five years, you'd almost certainly you'd leave, but certainly no more than 10 years, and that did not happen. But looking back, I was having a conversation with a Kenyan journalist the other day, and he was just shocked how much power uh, a Ugandan president has under the Ugandan constitution and the Ugandan president who does not have the desired appetite for constitutionalism. In any case, as I said, it's a Ugandan president who does not believe in pluralist polity. And in any case, Henry uh, talks about um, 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 uh, members of opposition and linking opposition continuously with this. Uh, it's, it's a blackmail thing that the opposition must be associated with people who are armed and throw bombs. It's actually not true. Enere actually um, threw bombs in Kampala. Enere came to power by, by force and that must be, be, must be stated. But really back to this. The idea that you, know, you appoint the vice chancellors of public university, the idea that you appoint the chief justice, the idea that you, you appoint the police chief, the idea that you appoint army commander, the idea that you appoint every head of an organization that matters in this country and you're a president and you actually lead one of the most corrupt, in fact the most corrupt regime in our independence history, including Amin, mm -hmm. then it just tells us that no, the most urgent thing we need to do as we celebrate or mark the Constitution today and also our Independence Day. It is urgent that we have a national conference in which uh, politically we have a fresh conversation that should really see us to in, in, in a direction in which we review our constitution. Part of the review of the constitution must really be an overhaul. Is it a new constitution? Is it, is it a total amendment? Okay. Whatever happens, the current the status quo uh, cannot uh, cannot cannot sustain uh, cannot cannot be sustained. All right. Unfortunately, we've opened a can of worms at a time where this conversation has to come to an end. But I will be happy having these guests yet again as we go through the 62 independence celebrations to continue to tackle some of these things. I think some of those things that we'll tackle is the foreign influence, uh, you know, that is uh, being uh, leaned <laughs> on towards, you know, uh, aggravating some of the issues that we see as a state, especially as far as sovereignty is concerned. This brings us to the end of our Kickstarter.